Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I have a tale of a longtime DM that finally wanted to be a player again, and found a game that seemed promising, only for it to be run by a DM that had a bad habit of railroading to the point of threatening players' characters with death if they didn't stick to the tracks. But first, I want to wish you all a happy holidays. Whatever you and your family celebrate, I hope you all have a fun and safe time. And if you're wondering what this doge might like for the holidays, liking, commenting, and sharing the video is all I could ask for. But with all that said, let's hop right into the story. How a GM style made me quit a game despite me liking the other players. By Reddit user, Jaketon. A bit about me. Let me start off by saying that in my experiences with tabletop RPGs, I quite often get thrust into the role of forever GM. DM versus GM, I prefer to be called a GM. No animosity, just my preference. I've been playing D&D and other tabletop RPGs for over 15 years now, and GMing almost as long. I have a lot of time with tabletop RPGs under my belt, but by far, the one I've played and run the most is Dungeons & Dragons. This story occurred only a few weeks ago and is still fresh in my mind. I don't intend to give more details than necessary to tell the story in order to protect the people involved. A quick warning though, I tend to get wordy and over-explain things, so if that bothers you, I'll leave a TLDR at the end and you can skip ahead. The Setup I had been running a D&D 5e game for almost a year, once a week almost without fail. The players were great for the most part, and while some didn't mess with the group or my GMing style, or found issue with something that happened in or out of game and dropped, I still found the time and energy each week to run my game. However, I was experiencing some burnout and stopped the game. Not long after, I found a Facebook post where GM was looking for players to join her game. I don't remember her name, so we'll just go with Ashley. I messaged Ashley privately about potentially being a player, and she was enthusiastic about my joining her players right off the bat. I was a bit put off by how readily I was accepted into the group, but nonetheless was happy to be a player again. Almost immediately, Ashley invited me to her D&D server and we started hashing out a character for me to play. I was confused a bit by her premise, but quickly found out that she simply didn't know the word for an Esekai game, essentially a game where the players are themselves thrust into the campaign setting. I wasn't looking for an Esekai game, and was honestly kind of bummed about it, but decided that since Ashley seemed so excited to have me, she was nice, and I agreed with most everything she had in her rules for how her games would work, that I would try out the game and just see how things went. After some confusion on character creation, as I was still unclear until a few days before my first session with her players that this was a true Isekai game, I finished my character and sent her the screenshots of the completed character. I rolled in her Discord server with her dice bot and ended up with some decently powered stats. I had 17, 16, 15, 12, 12, and a 7, and went with a dexterity-based fighter, using strength as my dump stat. Ashley told me that the group was level 5, and to make my character the same level, to accommodate milestone leveling. I took the resilient feat for dexterity, raising my 17 to an 18. This is important and will come into play later. The Game the players were great, and we got along quite well immediately. The group was laid back, and we joked around a lot as we played, some in character, some out of character. It was a good time, and I had a blast for the first session. We got into some shenanigans and basically did dumb D&D group stuff, despite me as a person in this kind of scenario being rather serious. However, the first problem arose within the first hour of the game. We met an NPC woman who was clearly odd but nothing about her suggested that she was anything other than human. We conversed, and it was revealed, not so subtly, that this woman had some sort of importance about names. I remember very clearly that I asked the woman in character what her name was. She in turn replied with a similar question that I can still remember the exact words of, because as a GM, Faye are one of my favorite creatures to let the party encounter, and I was being careful. What is your name? That is the exact words that was used by the NPC woman. I saw no threat here, as the question was inquiring what my name was, and I'd heard the scenario before countless times. I told her my name, and was then informed that I no longer had my name. I let it go and rolled with it, as it wasn't a big deal for how I intended to play the game. 
and I honestly thought it might be interesting to see if other people or NPCs started using a nickname when speaking of me down the line. However, I was still a bit miffed about the incorrect word choice. I kept quiet and we moved on. The session ended much earlier than I expected, but the group was quite large, and I'm used to running games that last much longer than the average session at 6-10 to 10 hours a session. So when we were done after only 3 hours, I was a bit surprised and disappointed. It only took me seconds to realize that other people don't have as open schedules as I do. I never voiced this as an issue, as it was minor, and only made me feel like a terrible person for getting upset about it. Midway through the second session the following week, I started to notice a pattern in the NPCs of this game. Before I explain how, I need to first elaborate on how the setting was laid out for us. The premise of the Esekai was that we had been tricked into a VR video game, but had come there willingly. I point this out because I'm still not sure if the NPCs were like how they were, as a stroke of genius, or if Ashley is just not the greatest at dialogue. However, the NPCs seem to all have the same personality. Flat, monotone, and generic, despite some interesting visual descriptions. I'm still not sure if I enjoyed this or not, but as a long-time role player, it bothered me. Once again, I did not voice my concerns, as everyone was having fun. I also noticed that the plot would change quite quickly, even going so far as Ashley telling us something we'd already roleplayed through hadn't happened that way, but another way. The change was minor, and we hadn't come across consequences for it, so we simply kept going. I was personally becoming concerned that Ashley might be a little bit too much of a by-the-seat-of-her-pants GM for my liking. I decided that if it was still an issue by the end of the third session, then I would simply drop out and barely be missed. I'm going to point out a few of my own flaws as a player here, as they came up in the third session. First, it was revealed to us that Ashley normally GM'd for us while she was high. I don't have a moral issue with this, but I was concerned that her responses and dialogue may have been affected by it. So, when Ashley asked for the players to vote on whether she should GM the third session sober or high, I put forth my vote as sober. About 30 minutes into the game, players were asking questions about roles and other simple mechanics. Mechanics I had memorized and can spout off from the top of my head. I don't know how long I waited, but I did make an effort to at least pause and give Ashley the opportunity to answer these questions. After a few seconds, I blurted out the rules as written and mentioned as I finished speaking that despite what Raw states, that it was up to her. I pointedly never asked a player to roll. But Ashley was getting frustrated with me, and whispered to me several times to stop. It took me at least three times to stop my backseat GMing, but I did and tried to stay quiet about rules and simply play the game for the rest of the session. As we play through the third session, we meet an NPC immediately after getting a list of necessary items that we needed to find in order to advance the plot through a ritual spell. This NPC was semi-hostile to our characters, but still willing to talk to us, we throw question after question at him, trying to find out where we can go to find the items we need. We question him so much that by the end of the conversation, we had more than half of our shopping list already collected. I notice this and decide to test a theory. Ashley is getting so annoyed with our questions that she's just giving us the things we need in hopes that we move on so she doesn't have to answer anything else. I suggest we go to a tavern for our next item, a Kraken's Eye. I order it from the bartender, as if it's a drink, and a small civilized argument breaks out in character. However, everyone still seems happy out of character. After about 5 to 10 minutes of this social encounter, the bartender asks us to leave, but not before making us a drink called the Kraken's Eye, and we get it for free. It's at this point, I make it a point to step back as one of the people who was taking center stage, as I had just had a scene. Our druid talks to a tree to get advice on where to go for our next item. The directions we get are extremely vague, and Ashley used the description, to the left, several times. We find the item, but are having trouble collecting it. Ashley tells us we hear a whistling that's getting closer. Ashley prompts us and asks if any of us want to hide. I decide not to, as whistling isn't really an indicator of anything ominous that I was aware of at the time. I'm one of the only players who doesn't hide, but not the only one. Ashley describes how we see a coyote approach, and when it sees me, the whistling stops, 
and it stands on its hind legs like a person. Before we can even react in character, she excitedly asks the players who knows their folklore. Being a GM myself, I state that I believe it could be a few things based off of that limited description. I suggest a coyote-based lycanthrope, or even a shifter from Native American folklore. I was reminded of the coyote of the Mercedes Thompson novels by Patricia Briggs. Worth the read if you like supernatural stuff. Anyway, before anyone else can guess, Ashley interrupts me and informs me that I'm wrong. After a brief exchange where I don't remember any more guesses, Ashley blurts out that the creature is another creature from Native American folklore. I was informed later that even talking about these things brings their attention, and often their ire to those who believe in them, especially those with Native American bloodlines. So I won't specify their name here. I will simply state that they are man-eaters with shape-shifting abilities that generally take on the appearance of coyotes and mostly appear only at night. Now, as a GM myself, and an avid supporter of homebrew, I am fully aware that these creatures do not have an official stat block, and after hearing their name, I was fully aware of what these things were, and were capable of in most folklore featuring them. However, were I to homebrew them while attempting to keep true to their challenge rating compared to other monsters in D&D lore, I wouldn't put them above a challenge rating 5, maybe 8 if min-maxed. Yet, as a party of 6 or 7 level 5 characters, we were given the choices to run or make a new character because we would die if we tried to fight it. At this point, I pointed out that all it did so far was notice us, stop whistling, and stand up. I ask how big it is and am only then informed that it's over 7 feet tall, and that we were beginning to hear more whistling from the forest that I wasn't even aware we were standing in until that moment. I then ask if it's doing anything threatening other than standing. I am then informed that no, it's not. I explain that because it isn't lunging, growling, or even standing menacingly in any way that is threatening, my character wouldn't know it's a threat, and continue to try to converse with it. At this point, Ashley tells the entire party, some of which are still hiding, quote, You can run or make a new character. Now, I have heard of railroading before, but to blatantly say that if players don't do one thing that they will die is a bit much. There are so many open-ended ways that the players could creatively deal with the situation, and any good DM would encourage such, not just say, do this or die. At this point, more than half the party decides to flee and I follow as to not split the party. Ashley then describes us running away, to the left. We run, and after a few more turns to avoid going toward more whistling, we get back to town and are stopped at the gate by a group of NPCs led by a woman. The first thing this NPC does is threaten to kill us if we don't follow her. Not wanting to try to play the party leader, but also not wanting to comply when we could take a five foot step and be safe in the city, I speak up and point out that if she had just asked us instead of threatening our lives with the first words out of her mouth, without so much as an introduction, we might have been more willing to comply. After a brief exchange where I don't let that issue go, the woman refuses to give us her name, and the party begins to back me up on how suspicious and untrustworthy this situation is. Ashley chimes in out of character once more, and informs us that she specifically designed this NPC to be able to TPK the party. I don't know that in character, and am giving no indication that would allow me to know that, so I continue to be suspicious and untrusting. It's at this point that Ashley, once again, threatens, go with her or make a new character. There we go again with threatening the party with character death if they don't take her railroad. How did she expect the players to react to an NPC coming up and threatening them? I inform her that I have no issue with losing a D&D character, and continue grilling this NPC for some sort of information that might allow me to trust her. Against all of my out-of-game expectations, the NPC woman actually makes me think our characters can trust her. As we go with this NPC, we are told that we go to the right, after four or five to the lefts in a row, from previous ways we went. This amuses me. We make camp with this woman, and I make a check to appear that I'm sleeping, but trying to stay alert so I don't get killed in my sleep. And I roll a natural 20. 
However, by the raw, I know that you can't actually automatically succeed on a natural 20, and I don't know if Ashley has any house rules about it. I tell her, natural 20, total of 24. Ashley then proceeds to tell me that I only have a 17 dexterity. I don't know why she had me roll sleight of hand, dex, for what should have been a deception, but I just rolled what she told me to. I told her that my copy, and the copy I screenshotted and sent to her, shows an 18 dexterity score. We argue for a few minutes before I remember why my dex is 18. I took the resilient feat. As I'm trying to voice that my feet up my dex score to 18, she interrupts me with, quote, I'm just going to move on. You nat 20 anyway, and we only have 30 minutes left of playtime. We ended the session less than 5 minutes later, though. I dropped out and left the server before we had a fourth session. I was polite and cordial in my message to Ashley that I was dropping, but left the server on Discord before she messaged me back. I never told her any of my issues with her game, even though I could have and should have. TLDR I joined an Isekai game, encountered a lot of small issues, and ended up with stiff RP, and PCs that could be pestered in the plot exposition, a GM who didn't understand feats can add to ability scores, poor descriptions of action, and being given a take the railroad or die choice twice in the same session. As a last little blurb, I want to say that I hold no ill will towards Ashley and wish her, her game, and her players the best. I just simply don't mesh well with her playstyle as a GM. If you'd like to know the name of the creature we had to run from, send me a private message and I'll let you know what it is. I don't blame OP for leaving after all that, though I do wish he would have told her why. Which sounds like he does too, as he was able to point out his own flaws as a player. I do like that OP wasn't a pushover and told the DM that he wasn't afraid to lose a character and pushed the issue of his mistrust of the NPC, but the dice rolled where they did and he ended up on the railroad anyway. Have you ever had a DM that railroaded this hard? If so, feel free to vent about it in the comments. Also, what do you think the creature the DM was referring to could be? I'm legit curious. Anyways, as always, I appreciate all of you, and again, Wish you all a happy and safe holiday. Until next time.